Hello, and welcome back to the channel, and to the sixth installment of I guess the only thing I'm going to be doing on this channel until I feel like doing anything else, Media Mondays. A show on the channel where I analyze, review, and rate consumable content, from movies and music and everything in between, and I'll talk about it all and put it on your screen. And at the end of every review, I will rate the piece of media I am covering as either meh, memorable, mediocre, a masterpiece, or a massive piece. Oh shit, this will be done on a scale from 0 to 5, and I'll have 4 different categories that I will rank and then average into an overall score. These categories are characters, story and plot, rewatchability, and the finality. I've got 2 reviews in mind for this Christmas season, and this is the first part of the Invisible Bill Christmas special, so without further ado, let's talk about a movie I'm sure none of you remember but need to watch, because just like on my calendar, it's almost Christmas. Little fun fact before we start off this review, turns out this was actually not the original idea that I had for this video. You see, the original plan for this was to do a redo of my now deleted Mulan 2020 live action review with my Chinese friend. But uh, she said fuck that, that movie shit, and honestly, there's no argument there. Anyway, we're just gonna review this one instead, Almost Christmas, what you need to know about that is that it is a comedic drama from 2016 and was written and directed by David E. Talbert, who is funnily enough the same man that plays Dr. Eric Foreman's mother in this movie. It eventually makes sense, I swear. But basically, it's a movie about a man who lost his wife a year ago, and now has his kids who are all grown up and have families of their own. They're gonna spend the holiday season with him and try not to fight with each other at every turn. So, let's see what Almost Christmas is all about. The movie starts off with a montage of a family growing up together as the years go by. And this pie is a reoccurring character, so uh, I guess it's important. I'm sure they'll explain that later. After 43 years of marriage, we learn that Walter's wife has sadly passed away. We also get to see how they introduce the kids and what they've been doing with their lives ever since that they, you know, grew up and stuff. We have the first child, Cheryl, and she is a doctor. The second child, Christian, he's a politician. The third child, Rachel, and she is a broke law student. And the last child, Evan, who is a college football star. Cool. After this introduction, we see the doc's husband, who is a washed up basketball star from Croatia, and he tries to riz up a rental car lady. You know, I think I know someone just like this who works at my job. The family members start to arrive, and after the broke law student turns down a date with Dr. Eric Foreman, the Rizzler comes in and tries to give everyone the same basketball trading card that he gave to that rental card lady. Thankfully, his wife, the doctor, stops him from continuing this bit. Later, Walter Myers, the grandfather who lost his wife a year ago, goes to a homeless shelter that his late wife would frequently volunteer at, especially around the holidays. After a famous backup singer named Aunt May cooks a lot of questionably edible food that no one wants to eat, she and a politician force his son to eat some, and after he runs off, the doctor makes a jab at how the broke law student is, well, broke, and also had a terrible divorce. To which, Rachel replies with, I was smart enough to get one. Oh, hey, I'm still in the room. Honestly, I always thought it was just so wild that she would say that to her big sister while her sister's husband was still right next to her, like, still in the room. That shit still gets me every time, and it's wild. And speaking of wild, everyone starts arguing after Rachel's comment until, and he in the house! Are y'all fighting already? You know, I think I had a guy like that who worked in my department store. Walter is disappointed that his kids are already at each other's throats and it's barely been an hour since they got here and he tells them to stop acting like petulant children and to start acting like adults just for five days and then they can go and do whatever they want afterwards as long as they make it through Christmas together. Four days until Christmas. After showing up to church for reasons unrelated to the plot, aside to remind us again that Walter's dead wife is, well, dead, the grandkids ask the Rizzler if he can fix the Santa animatronic decoration on the roof. And I shit you not, he says that because he spent two weeks working at Best Buy, he is qualified to fix it. When his wife tells him that he may hurt himself in the process, he responds by calling her the Grinch and then proceeds to fix the rooftop Santa perfectly and without a hitch. Just kidding, it literally blows up in his face along with the head of Santa before he gets knocked off the roof by the blast, sucks to suck, what a way to go. Unfortunately, Lonnie survives this. Oh, I mean, yay, he's all right. Three days until Christmas. The next morning, the broke law student wakes up and chooses violence for some reason by accurately, but unnecessarily, calling her little brother the accident child. In response to this, he decides to lock her outside the house on a cold December morning in nothing but her underwear. She tries to climb through a window, but it doesn't go so well. 
Thankfully, Dr. Eric Foreman is there to lend a helping hand. What a guy. Once she gets back inside, the family has a dance party in the kitchen before going out to buy a Christmas tree. A tree that no one wants to decorate, apparently, because literally they all go off and do their own thing as soon as they bring it into the house. The politician takes the kids to Town Square or wherever, where, I shit you not, another politician tells his kids that 75% of the Santas out there have hepatitis C. Dude, they're like 9 and 11. I'm willing to bet they can't even spell hepatitis C. They really don't care about what this random man has to say, and just go to see a Santa anyway. Completely unsupervised too, might I add. They just walk off from their mom and dad and probably were never heard from again. What a way to go. During all this, number 88, as I will continue to call him for the duration of this review, and his friend decide to go to a diner to eat, and also... I'll get them ho ho ho! You know, I think I had a guy like that who worked at my department. While children are probably going missing sitting on the lap of Hepatitis Santa, the Rizzler is off on a shopping errand for his wife. And while he's at the store, he runs into someone who is actually a big fan of his and his basketball career, and might just be interested in him too? Ooh, now we're getting spicy. After Dr. Foreman teases her about having the world's loudest insect in her hair that she should have definitely noticed by the way, but whatever, she decides to look at her bank account for no other reason than to remind us that yes, she is indeed a broke law student. Damn, negative $375, what the fuck? Unfortunately, Rachel's judgment is just about as poor as she is, but luckily her daughter's is not. She comes out to the porch and tells her mom that she emotionally manipulates her boyfriend to carry things for her at school, and that Omar Epps is not a bad guy, and neither are all the other men that she keeps scaring away by being rude to them. Cool. Two days until Christmas. The next day, the family decide to play a little football, and Dr. Foreman is there too, for some reason, which I never understood because Rachel has been actively avoiding this man like he's the plague, but this broke law student is literally the only member of this family I have ever seen him interact with on screen up to this point, so like, who invited him to play football? Oh well. All is going well with the football game until the Rizzler purposely trips 88 and a family feud ensues once again. Rachel, rightfully calling out Lenny for purposely tripping her brother and potentially threatening his football career, and Cheryl, the smart one of the four kids by the way, retorts by calling Rachel broke. Again. But it had nothing to do with the fact that her husband went out of his way to trip her brother and has yet to apologize for it. After slandering the good name of Waffle House, everyone decides to go their separate ways to cool off from the fight. This of course leaves Walter saddened and disappointed because the family was finally getting along and doing just fine until this incident. Having the moral support from his wife when he was clearly in the wrong was not enough for him as Lonnie goes back to the store specifically to cheat on his wife and eat an apple. After the Rizzler cheats on his wife, Rachel goes in the store where she runs into Lonnie's biggest fan at the checkout line, and the store whore is more than eager to show this broke law student just exactly where her lips have been and who her new boyfriend is. Ooh. And in perhaps what is the pettiest move I've seen so far in this movie, Rachel decides to invite Jazzy or whatever her name is, don't really care enough to remember the name, to dinner on Christmas Day. Oh no. After setting up this little scheme, Rachel gets called out by Dr. Foreman for having low self-esteem and follows it up by immediately making out with her. Great. One day till Christmas. The doctor decides to make some mac and cheese for Christmas and puts it in the oven. And after she leaves, Rachel Ray over here puts in her casserole or something and in the same oven, raises the temperature of the oven before saying, The temperature, half the time. That's not how cooking works, but whatever. I'm sure nothing bad can come of this at all. We haven't had any problems with Christian yet, and I literally think the movie forgot that he has to have an issue to overcome, aside from like, just being on his phone all day due to working really hard, not spending time with his kids. But honestly, my dad did the same thing too until I was like 20. I still love you though, dad. I know you watch my videos. Please don't unsubscribe from my channel. So, what is Christian's conflict that he needs to overcome? Apparently, his new campaign for Congress or something like that, will put the homeless shelter that his late mom loves so much in jeopardy. When the politician says to his father that he doesn't see what makes that place so special, and that the homeless people will eventually figure their lives out for themselves or something, Walter tells him that his mom used to live in that shelter when she was younger, for some time, and also, that's why it meant so much to her, and that's also why she would volunteer there as often as she did. But, there's no time for that, because, oh no, what an unexpected turn of events. The food in the oven is burning. Who could have possibly seen this coming? It's almost like there's a reason you don't cook food like that, Rachel. This time around when she butts heads with Cheryl, whose food was also ruined as a result of Rachel's carelessness, the broke law student is definitely the one in the wrong ear. And yet Cheryl is still the one who needs to help Rachel clean up the kitchen when she literally did nothing wrong in this situation. 
one which will ask her brothers for help. They say, fuck, fuck this shit, and they leave to go get a pizza or something, even though they go up the stairs and not out the front door, but whatever. But I guess that argument, and almost burning down the house, was worth it in the end. Because while cleaning up Rachel's mess, yes, Rachel's mess, they find a box that their mom kept all their recipes in, especially all of her homemade recipes, and they start to bond over it as they take a stroll down memory lane. We are again reminded that Rachel put bugs in Cheryl's collar green, but that's not the only meal of Cheryl she's about to ruin. Or is it? In a moment of clarity and forgiveness, and in the Christmas spirit, the broke law student realizes her pettiness and tries to fix her mistake by calling the home wrecker and telling her that she can't come to the house for Christmas dinner the next day. The call, unfortunately, goes to voicemail. So, Rachel does the smart thing, and instead of texting her, leaves the voicemail, and that's the end of that. I'm sure that is the last we will ever see of that store clerk for the remainder of this movie. Great job, Rachel. Job well done. Remember that sweet potato pie I mentioned earlier in the video? Well, turns out, Walter's wife was always the one who made it, but now Walter is trying to make it himself, and is continuously failing with every attempt at recreating his late wife's masterpiece. So, sometime later that night, this child whose name I can't be bothered to remember, sorry, small child girl, um, but she tells her granddad that he needs to smile more, and the reason he can't make the pie the same way that, you know, his wife did, was because he's not smiling enough and he needs to smile more. And he does. Cool. Zero days till Christmas. It's time for Christmas dinner, and all through the house, not a sibling was fighting, nor child or spouse. While eating a meal with salads and pork, Aunt May threatens to stab this man with a fork. 88 is unhappy that the house is pristine. He found a document last night, but what does it mean? It seems Mr. Walter wants to sell the home, but his children protest, then Evan gets up to go. After 88 leaves, there's a knock at the door, and with uncanny timing, appears the town whore. The Rizzler tries to hide, but it soon comes to light that she is with whom he cheated on his wife. When Cheryl finds out, her man needs to run. She comes back with a vengeance and a large shotgun. After it fires, we see that it missed. She did that on purpose, but is rightfully pissed. The cheater is unharmed and sadly still alive, but Evan got wrecked in his Jeep joyride. While in the ER, outside Evan's door, Rachel says sorry for bringing that whore. Cheryl forgives her, and through their discourse, they talk of how Cheryl will get a divorce. Rachel and Cheryl finally made up, as Walter goes to see Evan, who's just woken up. During all this, the politician meets with his financial backers and the four of them eat. The politician knows that this isn't right, when he sees a homeless family on a cold Christmas night. He then leaves his table and the men that are greedy, to go to the shelter and help feed the needy. And speaking of needy, this girl has no money, until her sister chips in for exposing that dummy. And speaking of exes, her date comes along and asks her if she will go with him to prom. Rachel leaves in a hurry, but before he gets mad, she puts on this outfit in 30 seconds flat. That's not how changing works. This movie isn't over, and if you're wondering why, it has something to do with the sweet potato pie. After drinking the best coffee he's had in his life, Walter and Aunt May both share a slice. They leave such a wonderful taste in their mouth that they tell everyone that there's pie in the house. With the family together and the house in the light, this is the ending of The Myers Christmas Night. I hope you like that little bit of rhyming I did for the last part. I really wanted to feel the Christmas spirit in that one, so I hope you did as well. This movie was a lot more chaotic than I remember it being, but then again, the last time I watched it was literally 7 years ago when it came out in 2016. But enough reminiscing, let's get to the breakdown part of this video, and what a better way to start than by talking about the most chaotic aspect of Almost Christmas, its characters. The cast of Almost Christmas is a rather long list, from the main characters, the side characters, and the supporting characters, all of which who I found out after looking at their other works are no minor celebrities in their own rights. So, how does Almost Christmas handle 14 different characters at minimum that is not a joke that you need to keep track of and stay invested in? They do a fairly well job, I'd say. A big issue with movies or stories like these, in my opinion, is that with just under two hours of time, you need to start, finish, and properly resolve every single character arc, issue, or problem of relevance that is to the plot. And with the more characters you have, the harder you need to try to make sure everyone's issues are equally realized and addressed 
and this movie sometimes seems to forget about some of the character arcs that it originally sets up, or even some of its characters altogether. Like, remember when I said those kids just left in the middle of a park to go find a Hepatitis Santa, completely unsupervised? The movie definitely didn't, because it's literally never brought up again, and the kids are just fine and dandy in the next scene that they're in, or even earlier on, when the little nerd boy whose name I can't even be bothered to remember, his first appearance showed him getting a B in gym and all A's in his other classes. Walter tells him that his Uncle Evan, you know, the football star, will help him with that. But I literally never even see him and Evan together throughout the entire film, and when the entire family is playing football, this Wish.com Steve Urkel kid doesn't even bother playing and is doing some crossword puzzle or something on the side. Not only is he the most forgettable of all the grandkids, but he was also the only one who had his own arc set up and it was just never followed up on. But Timmy Turner's brainiac best friend isn't the only one guilty of being a forgettable character, because the apple must not fall far from the tree as his dad was also as irrelevant as his son. If you watch the movie, you'll see that there's this guy right here and he's with the family to deal with Christian's campaign so he can enjoy his family time. I'm not even gonna bother telling you his name because that's how little shit I give about this man. I don't like this guy for three reasons. One. He doesn't give Christian the break that he's supposed to, which is literally the only reason he's here in the first place. Two, he takes up unnecessary screen time with his out of touch or sometimes even unwanted commentary and just makes moments awkward when they really don't need to be. And three, he didn't even need to be in the movie at all. I promise you that if you remove him from the film, nothing of value will be lost. This is a problem I think is prevalent in all of Christian's branch of the family because they don't really do that much and are kind of just set pieces to fill up our big happy family roster, but this guy in particular, he's gotta go. But back to Christian. Even though Evan was the accident child of the family, having Christian in the movie was an accident. Of all the four main kids, he is easily the most forgettable, and his entire arc was basically bigwig politicians are bad because they don't care about the little people. And while I'm not looking for something groundbreaking in a Christmas movie for goodness sake, I just feel like they could have kept his issue to needing to be there for his kids rather than needing to stop his campaign from bulldozing over a homeless shelter. One of these is just more Christmassy and family centric than the other one, and I don't think I need to tell you which one of the two it is. Not everyone in your family drama needs to have drama. It's okay to have more than one character be the voice of reason. Walter is usually filling in that role, but Kristen could have easily stepped up to do the same when his sisters are at each other's throats. And he does for one scene, and then never again. All the other characters were great, and even the ones that did nothing to stand out played their part very well, as they weren't meant to be part of the main family. But it was entertaining watching them when they were on screen. A girl who worked at the store and Evan's friend were both characters I always found myself asking, oh boy, what are they gonna do next? Whenever they showed up and whether they were raising the tension or providing a breath of fresh air, I generally enjoyed their scenes. I could keep going, but I think you get the point. A lot of the characters were handled well, while others left much to be desired. That's just my honest opinion though. Characters, 3 out of 5. Story and Plot Oh boy do I have some opinions about the overall pacing and story of this movie. Most are good, and some are not. Let's get the positives out of the way first. I really like the idea of having a family home for the holidays and the home that they all grew up in, and we get to see how they all changed, grew and whatnot over the years, and how things make them come together, but also come into conflict with each other. And I'm going to do something a little bit different since this film has multiple plot lines that don't always converge into one coherent story. So I will tell you which ones I think are good and which things I think kind of fucking suck. Here we go. First up is Walter being constantly reminded that his wife is dead. This one kind of fucking sucks because while it does provide motivation for some characters, it just feels like they need to keep on reminding us that his wife is dead and I just don't want to hear it after the third time. They even go to church for no other reason plot-wise other than to be told by the congregation that Walter's wife is dead. And I'm not even joking when I said that that's the only thing of value that happens in that church scene. Rachel and Cheryl's tit for tat always going at back at each other's throats and stuff. That one, I think this one was good, and the way that it brought conflict with Cheryl and Rachel. Cheryl and Rachel are diametrically opposed in the ways that Rachel is broke and Cheryl is a rich doctor. Rachel had a terrible marriage and divorce, and needing to take care of her daughter while working the graveyard shift at a Waffle House, while Cheryl is in a seemingly happy marriage, has no children, and again, is a doctor. Rachel will always take shots at her husband, usually when he is in earshot, which I still think is hilarious, which is what Cheryl cares most about, while Cheryl will constantly throw Rachel's failures back in her face and devalidate her little sister until they realize, you know what, they aren't so different after all. 
They also don't just resolve their issues instantly either. They need to have a few back and forths, broken up by moments of seeing eye to eye until they finally fix the relationship, and I love it for that. Rachel is so petty and it's hilarious to see Cheryl take a moral high ground stance every chance she gets, even when she's in the wrong. Hell, I would even go as far to say that this particular plotline slash conflict is the main driving force of this film's progression and development. Rachel's love life. Didn't ask, don't care. Literally could have removed her entire romantic tension dynamic with Dr. Foreman from House and the movie wouldn't have changed at all. Or if you were gonna go down that route, just make him a new guy that's into Rachel instead of be someone that she has, you know, beef with from 20 years ago. We already seen her butt heads with her older sister. She doesn't need another person from her past to fight with in this movie. Lonnie cheating on Cheryl. This one was about as predictable as a cold day in Alaska. In his first five seconds on screen time, he is seen actively trying to flirt with a rental car dealer. Lonnie, I will admit, is the most comedic character in this movie. Uh, the big twist that he was cheating on his wife didn't surprise me at all. And aside from helping Rachel and Cheryl resolve their differences, it really didn't do anything for, like, you know, the story as a whole. We literally don't even know what happened to Lonnie after Cheryl almost killed him with a shotgun. Hilarious plot thread, but it only serves to help a much more engaging one and doesn't really stand on its own. Christian's Politics I already spoke about this when I was talking about my issues with Christian the character, but had it not been for the fact that his campaign was directly threatening the homeless shelter his mom lived in when she was a kid, this would be so far removed from the plot that it's almost not even worth mentioning. Pass. Didn't like it. Didn't ask. Don't care. The Sweet Potato Pie Truly the unsung hero of this whole movie is the Sweet Potato Pie. Ever since Walter's wife died, he has been trying to recreate her Christmas masterpiece, and yet he keeps on making bad batch after bad batch after bad batch, and he doesn't know what to do, until another one of Christian's forgettable kids tells him to smile more, which is the only thing of relevance she does this entire movie, I swear tell me something else she does, you cannot- But he makes the pie now, and everyone can be happy with a yummy dessert to eat at the end of the film. I find myself forgetting just how important this pie is whenever I watch this movie until they bring it up, which is crazy because the first scene we see in this movie is the pie. The first line of dialogue in the movie is about finding the recipes to make this pie, and all throughout the opening montage we keep seeing the same pie, the same sweet potato pie. But that's not to undersell its importance, as it is literally the thing that brings the entire family together at the very end of the film. Not the most engaging side story to follow, but definitely better than our last entry on this list. Walter selling the home. After his wife dies, Walter wants to sell the house. Obviously the kids don't like that because, you know, they grew up there and they have a lot of memories and all that, but he doesn't really care until the very end of the film when he decides not to sell it. Cool. It's not like this comes out of nowhere. We see him with this document that says he'll sell the house multiple times throughout the film, but this part I always wind up forgetting because of how quickly it gets resolved and how little I actually care. To put this into perspective of how little this matters, when the family finds out that Walter is going to sell the home, only one of them gets up to leave. When the family finds out that Lonnie cheated on Cheryl, it's basically World War 3 in the house, and everyone is worried as to what Cheryl is going to do when she comes back. She comes back with a gun, by the way. The situations with selling the house weren't as tense as the build-up to the reveal that her husband is a cheater, and the house plot had twice as much screen time to have more build-up than that. It was resolved way too quickly as well, and I just don't care about it that much. Like I said, Cheryl and Rachel's conflicts are really are the main story, and all these other ones just complement them. And for that, I'll give the story and plot of this movie a 3.5 out of 5. There were just too many side quests that I didn't care about or had nothing to do with the main story to keep my interest. Like, more than the ones that I even mentioned, those were just like the main ones that were semi-important. But everything else that they did, they did pretty well, and I like it for that. Rewatchability is almost Christmas worth rewatching. I'm not gonna mince words. This is a Christmas movie, which true value really shines around Christmas time. I'm not gonna go out of my way to watch almost Christmas anywhere between January 2nd to maybe November 26th. Some people watch Christmas movies year round, and those people are wrong. Me personally, I am watching this movie in the Christmas season and no other time. And since it is very seasonal based for me, that does automatically knock it down a star. But while it's not the world's best Christmas movie, I would rewatch this one over other things like the latest Grinch movie, Krampus, any of the Home Alone movies that came past the first one, or any of the Santa Claus series, you know, the ones with like the legal claws. That pun kind of ran its course after the first joke, but that's just me. It's a fun ride and definitely more relatable than needing to find a wife before Christmas Eve or 
Christmas Eve is going to be doomed or something, or setting up Fisher-Price saw traps around your house to stop the most incompetent burglars from robbing your house. I feel like having a family around and not always getting along with them is just a universal thing that anyone can understand, anyone can relate to that. And all the hijinks that ensue are just par for the course in some homes around the holidays. While this isn't my first pick for a Christmas movie, we'll get to that in the next episode of Media Mondays, it does typically make my top 10 list, so I'll praise it where I can. Almost Christmas gets a 3.5 out of 5 for rewatchability from me. And lastly, the finale. A finale can either make or break your film, this is what I like to say at the start of this segment. So, let's see how the finale of Almost Christmas holds up for me. Obviously, because it's a Christmas movie, you know we gotta end in some sort of, you know, big happily ever after, which, while it does make the ending predictable, once you stop and remember that you are watching a Christmas movie, it wasn't obvious already. But, the way it ends and starts the same way it all began, I really like it for that. With the family together there at Christmas time, eating sweet potato pie, and enjoying each other's company. All the bad apples have been thrown out, and it's just a loving atmosphere in the house with no one around to be toxic. Walter isn't going to sell the house, and it seems as if everyone has finally learned the true meaning of Christmas or something like that. While this kind of ending for a Christmas movie is about as cliche as it gets, it does a great job of rounding off all the characters and bringing an end to each of their individual character arcs and conflicts. Except for poor old what's-his-name, I guess he'll never be able to get an A&G now that his uncle didn't help him get better at sports. Jokes aside, this ending gets a 4 out of 5 from me. I like it and all of its entertainment factor it brings, and just the whole full circle concept of ending a movie, how and where it started, is always a plus for me. A cliche, yes, but if not for cliches, we wouldn't have any Christmas movies, now would we? All of these scores together give Almost Christmas a final average of 3.5 stars out of 5. A bit of a mediocre movie, yeah, but yet, I would still say it's worth a watch around the holidays. I found this movie when I was in my eye on television phase as a kid, and I was watching the Doctor Show House, I'm sure y'all have heard that show before, and it made me feel like I was better than those who were watching Grey's Anatomy or Scrubs because the main character isn't like some woo-woo girl, they are like, a bit of a prick, but we like him though. And he's like a cripple, so, you know, more reasons to like, root for him. After learning that Dr. House was the roach in Monsters vs. Aliens, don't watch that movie by the way, I decided to see what else these people were in, and found out that Omar Epps, the actor for Dr. Foreman, was in this movie. And I'm like, fuck it, I'll watch this movie then. Let's see where it goes. And I was not disappointed. This movie was a fun ride, all things considered, and it's not like any of the other Christmas films I had seen up until that point. But I think that's also what made it different and worth revisiting for my holiday episode today. And speaking of my holiday specials, I'll give you a hint as to what the next one is. The main character is called Kmart by his crush, and Tyler James Williams was in this movie too. If you get the answer to that right, I will be sure to congratulate you in my next video once it comes out. However, that's going to be where I leave off for now. Thanks for staying until the end, and a big thank you to all 78 of the voices in my head for getting me to this point. Tell me what you thought about this video, and what you want to see me talk about next time. But, until that next time arrives, I'm Invisible Bill, and that's all for my spill. Like, comment, hit subscribe, you'll never know when, but I'll see you next time.